Hello, hello, everybody. Oh, we have so many amazing people coming through. Hello, Kim Terry. I owe you a response back. Um, yeah, I know you sent me an email. I have been uh, ridiculously um, traveling all over the place, and we have people coming in all over the place. Yes, this is amazing. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and share a screen here so that you guys we can see the presentation that we're going to be covering today. How exciting is this? The seven surefire ways to sell more faster. Um, I have I'm without my headset and everything today, so please let me know if um, if you're having any audio qualities or anything. Um, and please uh, always feel free to um, to have a conversation. In the chat. I always do keep that open. But welcome everybody. We have people from um, all over. It looks like um, a ton of people from the US, a ton of people, a few people from Canada, a um, few people I have met in person, a bunch more that I have had conversations with, and many, many more that I haven't even had the opportunity to uh, to connect with live and in person. So thank you. This um, this is very heartfelt and wonderful to have so many amazing people uh, join us today. So the seven surefire ways to sell more faster. This uh, was for so my most popular talk is a talk called Nine Fatal Errors uh, That Market Leaders Don't Make. Um, for those of you that uh, joined me from last year, um, it was a presentation that I had done for Zoom um, last year this time. It's also a presentation that I had done for um, HubSpot when I had for in 20, it was a 2018 talk, although then it was called something else. Um, it was called uh, how to close more sales faster from your one-to-one -one marketing leads and uh, and then eventually became nine fail sales errors um, out of that we had a lot of people come back to us with even more questions they had questions about well how does this actually you know how, how are some some of this actually apply to my business um, what do I do in this instance and what do I do in this instance because we were only just scratching on the surface so today we're gonna take that and we're gonna go even further we're gonna go into seven more steps that you can possibly do to help make more sales faster faster. So I want to start off with a true story. Um, there was, uh, it's a uh, now a graduate client of mine, but she had started her business in 2015. She had a marketing agency. She developed it um, through the ability of helping more tech companies be able to achieve um, what was it? Investor funding. Like her, her specialty was really around helping companies and creating videos for them so they can get more investor money. Like this is a great marketing agency for her. And what she found was that even though she was incredibly smart, incredibly analytical, she had some great conversations, she struggled to get over that hump. And I think a lot of us know what this kind of feels like, that hump where you have a great product, you maybe have had some great conversations, maybe you're just in the beginning stages where you haven't yet had the, the confidence yet to go and approach new companies and new businesses. I was chatting with one woman this morning and her struggle was around, well, how do I go ahead and start approaching people? I don't even know what my product is yet. And so for her, the hump was, I can't approach people because I don't know what my product is. In this woman's case, her hump was that she couldn't go ahead and actually close the deals. The conversations were had, but people couldn't put the disconnect. And because her thing was, I'm going to help get you more investment dollars, there was so much risk and uncertainty in there that a lot of the companies were coming back to her and say, well, if you're so confident on what you can do works, how about we pay you after we get the investment dollars? Now, I know that sounds lovely, and I know in a perfect world we would be able to do this, but we're all businesses, right? Ultimately, what she's saying is, yes, I'm willing to go ahead and spend 40, 80, 100 plus hours creating this content for you in hopes that it will actually get there. No, my time is valuable, and the products I'm going to put out there is valuable. And even if it doesn't get us to the end goal, there's other ways that we can potentially use it. So she had hired someone else, so hoping that they would actually bring in the sales. Because if she wasn't comfortable enough having these sales conversations or pushing those clients over the edge to invest with her, hopefully by hiring someone, they would be confident enough to be able to sell it. I mean, we've seen this with a lot of sales organizations. When we're selling something other than ourselves, we're selling a product that is somebody else's, we're one hand removed, it's sometimes easier to talk about it. So she had hired this woman to go ahead and bring in the deals but what she found was they just 
weren't really doing it. The, the woman wasn't able to communicate the same passion that she was. And even though the conversations were really good, she was still running into the same issue because she's like, well, now how do I I teach somebody to get over this hump when I don't even know how to do it myself. If I don't know how to do it, how can I eventually teach an employee to do it? Eventually, she had to fire that other, that other employee, which left her feeling really heartbroken. Because when you're growing your company, and then you get to that point where you have to fire someone, on top of not being able to make the sales, now you're having to deal with the issues of like, am I still a failure? Am I failing because I'm not able to actually make those conversations forward? So I had met her over a year ago. Um, she had seen my information and she's like, oh my goodness. She's like, everything that you're breaking out is the reasons why I wasn't able to communicate it to my employee, why I wasn't able to close the deals, why I wasn't able to create the systems and the processes. And she goes, and what you gave me was a system you gave me consistency and a cadence that now when I look forward, I know exactly what I need to do. So today we're going to be going through what does that system have to look like? Now, most of you have an idea of who my background is, but I started off working in corporate sales. I worked at Xerox and one of the things that Xerox gave you was the process in able to actually make the sales accordingly. You follow this step and then you get to this step and then you get to this step. And when sales is broken into a process, it makes it less feeling that I'm either doing it or I'm not doing it. There's no more this feeling of I am a salesperson or I'm not a salesperson. And rather the feeling of I know exactly what I need to do. I know that when I wake up on Monday morning, these are the three steps that I need to do. And if you've had the fortunate privilege to be able to connect with me and have a conversation, hopefully at the end of the conversation, I gave you a homework assignment. Because most people I do, and one of the first homework assignments I do, and I will follow up with them a week later, and they're like, oh my goodness. Like, I can't believe how much clarity, how much focus, how much more I'm able to accomplish in that same period of time. So we want to be able to create this. Xerox did it for me, and now I want to continue with that and give you the opportunity to have that same level of Fortune 500 sales training without the Fortune 500 price tag. Because let's be honest, if we could all afford forty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 worth of sales training for a team, we probably wouldn't be entrepreneurs anymore, right? We'd have a team, we'd have a whole bunch of people. But the unfortunate reality is we have to start where we start, whether that is by chance or choice, or whether that is the stepping stone to get us to the new level. So when I went away, I left corporate, uh, corporate America, essentially, I left all of it and came back. I looked at myself and I said, what makes me feel more fulfilled? What makes me feel happy? Because the reality was for me, it wasn't feeling like because I was saving some other client 0.01% of their bottom line when they were already generating $300 million, really excited. What made me really excited was watching people like you, you on the webinars, go from literally zero in revenue to your first $100,000 because that's life changing. Going from a position where you feel like $60,000 is where your cap is, because you know what, I'm, I'm accepting the idea that I won't make as much in a salary or as much in my own business as I was in a salary when I was working for a company. And turning and transforming that entire thing to now where you're working with less time, you're connecting with your clients on a deeper level, and you're being able to actually push that boundary 200,000, 250, or in my case, pushing that seven digit number because I want that for you. I want that for you and I want you to feel less, you, I want you to have way more sleep. You're not keeping yourself up at night anymore. You're not crying into your pillow asking yourself, where is that next revenue dollar coming from? But rather feeling empowered and knowing that I get to say no to the clients that are no good for me. I get to demand my worth in the market because now I know the system to communicate that. 
So your first skill when it comes to understanding how to sell more faster is simply this, right? Number one, marketing and sales are not the same. Okay, full stop. Too many people get confused and they automatically assume that marketing and sales are the same, right? I'm spending a lot of time generating marketing and sales. People will tell me, Kim, I already am working with somebody on my marketing. I don't need somebody working on my sales program, right? If I had, and we talked about this in Nine Fatal Errors, if I had enough leads, then I don't have to worry about this. Okay, if you look at companies' annual reports, if you went to some of the biggest organizations in the world and you looked at their annual reports, what you'll find is there's this piece called the income statement, right? The income statement. This is also known as sales, the sales statement or the revenue statement, or they'll actually outline it as such. The line item, instead of income, they'll call it sales or they'll call it revenue or they call it income, okay? Those words are all interchangeable. Marketing, on the other hand, is not interchangeable with sales, right? This is just from a standard income statement standpoint. Marketing is sometimes also known as retail or promotion, but you would never read a Fortune 500 company's annual report and see inside the line items on the, the income statement, you would have marketing generated this much money. It's sales, it's revenue, it's income. That's what we ultimately do. Marketing is really about knowing how your market, how your clients will respond when you already know how to sell to them. What we ultimately want to do is we want to know if I'm having a conversation with Alexis or Barb or Daryl or Grove, how would I turn that into a dollar as quickly as possible? rather than the marketing side of this. And from a very simple sales cycle standpoint, this is about understanding how do we turn the, the smallest conversation into the dollar the fastest. When we start to add marketing on top of that, what we're ultimately doing is we are adding layers to our already developed sales cycle. And if you understand how it works, you're going to see that now if you're only focusing on marketing and marketing can mean a wide variety of different things for each one of your companies. Maybe this is crowdsourcing. Maybe this is Facebook ads. Maybe this is blogging. Maybe this is a ton of just generic networking. But if you're not marketing to the right people because you don't know how to turn that conversation into an ultimate sales cycle, you're going to say the wrong things and you're going to leave your client feeling alienated because I don't really know if I need that product. I don't really know if I suffer from that problem. And what we're going to be doing is no different than just screaming at a wall, hoping that the wall will react to us. We don't know what the door looks like to walk through there. So when we talk about what it looks like, I want you to look at your own sales cycle. Look at your own conversations and say, Start at the smaller, um, sorry, start at the smaller distance to the dollar, right? How do we get to the dollar as quickly as possible? And in most cases, for those of you that are specifically in some type of consulting service, right? You're selling a consulting. Maybe this is um, HR outsourcing. Maybe this is uh, IT management. It could be engineering, project management. Uh, perhaps you're doing maybe something more, more individual. I was chatting with one woman who did a lot of book editing work, right? She was a book consultant for a lot of these thought leaders very consultative. I can't touch book editing. I can't touch IT services and I can't touch HR recruitment um, and outsourcing. So we start at the dollar and then we say, what comes right before the dollar? Well, probably a proposal. Well, we can't just throw out proposals all over the place. So what has to happen before the proposal? Well, it's probably a meeting. Okay, great. Well, not everybody's, we don't have all these meetings lined up. So how do we get the meeting? Well, let's start talking to people and asking them for the meeting. That's the smallest distance. That's the smaller distance to the dollar that we need to focus on first and foremost before we start adding on the layers of marketing, brochures, blog posts, uh, podcasts, whatever you want to do, that one to many, that pray and spray approach. Those only make sense when we've already had a very articulate conversation with someone who has said, This is the issue that I'm dealing with. Number two. 
we want to measure our success by our actions, right? There's that old conversation that says something like, you know, say something and I won't even ignore you, right? Actions speak louder than words, right? This is where the, we really want to look at our own sales cycle. This is about being truthful and honest with ourselves. Are your actions aligning to the goals that you've set out for yourself? I think it is fantastic that you have goals with for yourself that are a hundred thousand two hundred and forty five hundred thousand dollars I chatted with one gentleman and he had a goal of two million dollars and right now he was making zero I am not one to tell you that your goals are too lofty I am a big believer in having big hairy audacious goals go shoot for the stars and land among the moon I think that is fantastic but you have to know what are the actions that get you to that state, to that goal. How are you going to measure your level of success? So the first thing you want to do is you want to calculate your sales funnel. And I'm going to show you here in a second how you possibly do this. And watch it in your CRM. So CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. And there is a lot of tools out there. You can find plenty of free or really low price CRMs. Personally, I am a huge fan of HubSpot. I love HubSpot and they have a free CRM for life. Go check it out. If you are not using HubSpot, you can find other ones like Pipedrive or Zoho, or there's like a whole bunch of industry specific ones. What is not acceptable is keeping track of your information in an Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheets do not give you notifications. You cannot filter them in the same way you can with a CRM. A CRM tells you, listen, you haven't contacted this person in 90 days. It's probably time to give them a call. Listen, you promised this person you were gonna give them a call in two weeks. You're two weeks is up here's your notification we want to make sure that we're using tools to help us move our sales cycles forward so what you need to know if we're wanting to measure our actions is number one how many meetings do you need every single week how many meetings do you need and where will you find your ideal clients get laser focus on who you want to talk to I said if for those of you that have chatted with me one of the first homework assignments I typically give any of our future students is to start creating that list of 100 100 ideal clients because it gives you laser focus it gives you the opportunity to say here's what I need to do here's the action that I need to follow up with and what is your plan if you don't achieve that I promise you I have tried to buy my groceries from the grocery store using prayers and hopes and dreams right I hope that deal will come through I hope that client will sign that deal I tell you what I have tried and the grocery stores don't accept it as a form of currency. And so I do not want you to hope and dream and pray that the deals will come through. I want you to know, and I want to give you a system that is going to help give you what is the plan B? What is the plan B? And how do you know 60 and 90 days in advance that it might not happen so that you have the time to take action now it is a lot more comforting to know that you are not going to achieve your main numbers in march because in march we can do something about it when the mortgage payment comes up in may and we don't know how we're going to make it when we now have to jump on a plane to go to a friend's wedding and we have no idea how to afford that or we can already see that we're not going to make our car payment our insurance payment instead of waiting for the anxiety to build up we can actually do something about it today so that we can say, okay, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what I need to be able to focus on. I hope for some of you, this is making a lot of sense. Go ahead and throw in the chat. Let me know like how you're enjoying the conversation so far. Is this making sense? Is it not? Um, I will try to save up time for a little bit of questions at the end as well. Um, but what we'll do is if you have any questions, put it in there right now. If I have time to address it, I will. Um, otherwise, I will go from uh, smallest to, or to longest question uh, up um, and we will answer those questions in that order. But the thing I want you to know is that revenue is your lagging indicator. Revenue will tell you what you've already done, whereas meetings are going to tell you what 
you have needed what you will need to do. Meetings will tell you that this is the thing that you need to measure for. I had a company reach out to me and ask me, Kim, how do you measure success for your salespeople? And I said, meetings. Simply meetings. Revenue is lovely, right? And revenue is fantastic. But what I don't want to see is that they're meeting with the wrong people. They're meeting with, the, with people that are too small to ultimately buy our services or they're just not having enough meetings, right? If I can see that the meetings are in the calendar, I know that it's going to eventually happen. If I'm not seeing the meetings in the calendar, what are we gonna do? Are we just gonna just hope? Are we just gonna say, okay, well maybe this will happen? Meetings are the things that you need to measure. So how many meetings do you need? So this is kind of your average sales funnel. Now this isn't going to be for everyone, but I want you to take this as a starting point. I want you to say, okay, if we started here, how do we make this happen? So at the very end of the day, we need to understand what are our closed deals? How many closed deals do you need in a month? And this is simply done by this is my goal revenue divided by what my average client is going to buy. And for those of you that are saying, well, I sell products all sorts of different price points and it all depends and everything, don't overcomplicate this, okay? Just go with what do you think would be the average price point or at least the most common dollar price point that somebody would buy. Let's say you're a company that sells services anywhere from $500 to $50,000 dollars right yeah we can go anywhere the average of those two will probably be around twenty five thousand does that mean that majority of the clients are going to be buying that probably not because our leading offering or the one we sell most commonly is five thousand dollars so five thousand dollars really becomes our average price point or at least our most common price point let's assume we want to make up ten thousand dollars or twenty five thousand dollars this month right we'll take twenty five thousand dollars we divide it by five Five, which means I need five closed deals every single month. That's my monthly goal, five deals every single month. The proposals you need are going to be about two times that number. Now, I hope we don't get to two times, but I would much rather us over prepare than under prepare. So that means we need to find the time to put out 10 proposals every month. The number of meetings we need is four times the number of closed deals. So if I need five deals this month, I need to have 20 meetings every single month. Now I ultimately want to actually divide this into a weekly target because weeks actually mean something to us. We see Monday through Friday and we can see. So if we're saying five meetings every, or 20 meetings a week divided by four, which brings us back to five, five meetings every single week. I know I'm going to hit my targets if I am meeting with a client, five, or five different clients every single week. If I make that my non-negotiable, I am going to hit my goal or maybe slightly above or slightly ab above or below it, but at least I'm better set up than going in and saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I have to do, right? Maybe if I have enough conversations. This is about giving you a plan and giving you focus. Now, ultimately before that is going to be prospecting. This is where that list of 100 is. This is those ideal clients that we want to work with them. And the big question I wanna ask yourself is if you're going to target someone, are you excited to call them at least five times in a year? If you're not excited to call them at least five times in a year, get them off your system. Get them off your target because they are not going to work with you, right? They're not going to be someone you're going to be passionate about when they eventually become your client. So focus on who you want to work with. You're going to probably have to talk to about 10 different people before one of them will eventually become a client. Now, do you have to make 10 phone calls for every, every client? No, not necessarily because remember your meetings, your goal is ultimately to get to four meetings. So if I made four phone calls and they turned into four meetings, yippity do, that's fantastic. I don't have to do any more work. If I make six calls that lead to four meetings, okay, fair enough. If I make 10 calls or 20 calls to get to four meetings, then something starts to get broken. Because then it says, okay, if I'm having to make 20 phone calls or 50 phone calls to get four meetings, something's not res resonating with our messaging. And going back to what I said about marketing not being equal to sales, above this, 
now becomes your marketing funnel. And this is where people get mistakes. Because if we just looked at what e-commerce tells us in general, it's a two to 3% conversion, a 50 to one, right? And if you're focusing on what's my 50 to one in order to get me just to the one to one, you are wasting your time and your energy. Focus on the shortest distance to the dollar, right? What's the small, so start at the smaller distance to the dollar, right? The smaller the distance, the faster you'll get to that dollar. And this is about helping you sell more faster. Okay, number three, right? I spoke a little bit about your ideal client, but I want you to really hone in on this, right? When you focus on the who, that becomes better for the what. When I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs who are just getting started on their businesses, they struggle to get their heads wrapped around with what do I sell? What do I provide my clients? What is it that I do? What do I do better than anyone else? I want you to stop that. Because when you focus too much on the what, what is it that I sell? I sell amazing coffee, right? Now I have to go out and try to ask everyone if they want amazing coffee. Maybe I filtered out, you know, that I want to work specifically with this person. But now I have to tell this person that this is the amazing coffee that they want, right? I created an amazing coffee. This is what you want. I create amazing project management. This is the project management that you want. I do amazing HR outsourcing services. This is the HR services that you need. Now, the problem with doing that is it doesn't appeal to people's inherent beliefs about themselves, is that I am unique, I am different, and I am individual. I don't fit into a mold. I don't fit into the same thing that everyone else has. I need to be treated as an individual. And when we try to say, here's the cookie color cutter, fit into this, you're going to be faced with resistance every single time. For most of you that come to me and tell me afterwards, Kim, my biggest struggle is that I constantly feel like I'm selling. I constantly feel like people don't really appreciate what I have to offer. I constantly feel like I'm bugging people about my service offering. This is the biggest area that you need to focus on because you are bugging people about what you're selling them. You're telling them what they need to buy as a opposed to being genuinely interested and curious about who they are as individuals. You're not listening to their own needs. You're not understanding what they want because once you, once they be, once they know that you understand them, then they can say, Oh, I get it. I get how this is going to be. Now I use the analogy sometimes about I don't know how, like, we can all very much, I think probably 90% of us, there's always going to be that crazy 10% that say, I hate chocolate cake. And I'm like, I don't even know what kind of person like believes in that. But you're going to have people that generally say, yes, we like chocolate cake. Wonderful. I don't know what chocolate cake tastes like to you or to you or to you, right? I don't know if Carrie likes chocolate cake or Mark likes chocolate cakes or Paul or Tally, what chocolate cake tastes like to them. What I do know is that if I understand what kind of cake they want, I can say, yes, we can appeal to that. Yes, this is how it's going to help you achieve your goals. You may have only a singular product and that's fine. But for everybody individually, they will tell us how they want that to um, impact them. Think of this in their banks do this a lot often. Banks will say, open up a savings account with us, right? A savings account, another intangible thing. Yeah, we can see our money grow, but there's no value in seeing a savings account. And the bank won't tell you how to use your savings account, but rather they'll say, what are you saving up for? What is your dream? And then the person will be like, a vacation, a wedding, a new home, a car, retirement, whatever it is. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The savings account is the savings account. The money in there is for the bank to go ahead and reinvest and do what they want to. But how each one of you wants to use that particular product is going to be completely different and unique. And so you want to know who you work with first before you focus on the what. The other nice thing is, is that once people believe in you, they believe that you have something to offer them, it doesn't matter what you're buying. Because those who love you will buy whatever you're selling.
They already know the value that Lynn or Kim or Jocelyn provides them. They already feel this. And so when it comes time to offer a second service offering, when it comes time to change the conversation, when it comes time to provide a different type of product or service, you immediately go back to the who instead of trying to recreate a what and then find a brand new who. Let's make this faster. This is how we move that sales cycle faster and faster because we focus on who we want to work with and then create what they need every single time. And this develops when we're meeting with people. So once you get that meeting, once you get over that nervous, I don't know what I'm going to say, right? And we will help you with that. If you're nervous, if you're anxiety, if you have self-doubt about saying the wrong thing, make sure you connect with me immediately after this webinar because I want to help you. I want to get you over that hump that is for you. But when you are meeting with somebody, you want what do you want to know about your client? What will help you determine that they are a perfect fit for you? What do you need to know about them to determine that they will connect with whatever solution that you know you are capable of providing? And if you don't have the solution yet, you know that you are capable of finding the resources to help them get to the answers, right? You might not have all the answers, but do you know how to get the answers? Hopefully the answer is yes. And then you're going down the right path. We need to know what is the client's goals, right? Going back to the banking, what are your goals? What are you saving up for? What is your dream? Going to an HR outsourcing company, how many more people would you want to hire? How will that help you achieve the top 50 best employers in your state or your province, right? What are their fears? What happens if you don't get an IT managed service? What happens if you don't automate this? How many more mistakes will it cost you? How does that make you sound? Or how, what are you afraid of that you're going to appear in front of your clients? And what do they need to get to that next step? These are all questions that I ask my own clients. When I'm in my own sales cycle, I specifically ask these clients along with so many other ones. But these are great starting points to just know. The one thing that I, when most salespeople start off, right, we've all heard the, the buyers, uh, what do they call it, the, um, uh, you know, when you first, first move advantage, not first move advantage, but you, you start something new, right? You know, um, new user's luck or something, right? Beginner's luck, that's it. I'm searching my brain. Uh, beginner's luck, right? We've all heard about beginner's luck. Ah, oh, the person got beginner's luck, right? I want to be very clear with you. There actually is very little luck involved. The beginner's luck is essentially because they were more genuinely curious and interested. They were paying more attention to the conversation and the things that were going on around them. Whether we're talking about a poker game where beginner's luck is really like, okay, I have these cards, what, like, what's everyone else's facial reactions? They're paying more attention. And they're watching what other people are doing and they're asking themselves, okay, that person made that move. Why did they make that move? What was the ultimate intention behind that? They're taking their time before they go ahead and, and, and take their next step. When I was in my first year of sales, one of the things people would say is, oh, Kim, Kim made, you know, you, you rep of the year because she just had beginner's luck. It was her first year in territory, right? She beat out 131 other sales reps because it was just for beginner's luck. But when we actually look back onto it, there was no such thing as luck. Right? I was actually approaching every single conversation like I would love to know more about you. Please teach me about your company. Please tell me what I need to know. Tell me what all the other companies that have failed you in the past did wrong. And tell me if you were me, what would you do differently? And just this conversation of genuine interest and curiosity made people appreciate me much more. And it made them say, this woman is actually listening to what I have to say. She's actually taking the time to understand me. And now that she's spent all that time understanding me, I'm going to take the time to understand her. Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Use your genuine interest and curiosity as an advantage. Use the fact that you don't have a ton of testimonials and a ton of referrals and all of this amazing base as an advantage to your company. 
Because do you think a well-established company is going to spend that much time getting to know their clients, is going to spend that much time just understanding who they are and what they're doing and why they do it that way versus something else, and just from a level of genuine interest and curiosity? That's a powerful place to be. And if I had a magic wand, boop, 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 boop I would give each one of you that skill set more than anything else. The, one of the things that we see though is that people want to be going ahead and proving themselves, in, especially in this first meeting. You will lose me every single time as a buyer if the first thing you do is jump into a presentation or a demo. Like, you know, I said face palm. Like, I want you guys like, ah, like this is a big face palm moment here. Stop it. Stop it. Like, if somebody asks you to come in and present to us, listen, David, I would love for you to come in and present to us our, your solution. David, I want you to say thank you. I look forward to it. And I want you to put whatever your presentation is off to the side because we want to just explore the client's needs and goals and aspirations and fears first before we tell them how it will fit for them. But people will use the demo or the, or the presentation as the opener. But once you've given me everything that you have to offer, now I've taken this information. I said, okay, well, does this actually fit my business? Am I genuinely interested in this? I have seen more companies as a buyer, as a buyer's perspective, I have seen more companies that I might have been genuinely interested and excited about go from not even as a consideration because their first meeting with me is a demo or a presentation. And it's not because I'm um, pretentious or anything. It's because now I know what you have to offer. Uh, why, like, you know, what do I need to know about, right? I might have additional questions, but I'm like, okay, well, that's your offering. Now I still need to spend time thinking about it. But there's, I don't need to think about it with you anymore because you've already given me everything. You've opened the kimono and you said, hey, you, you've essentially pulled a naked man, okay? And you've said, hey, here's my body, right? Here's naked man. You know, are you interested or are you not? And I'm just like, um, okay, right? And maybe, maybe I got a bit of a 50-50 chance for those of you that are like, you know, how I met your mother. <laughs> you'll get that reference right maybe I'm interested maybe I'm not right but now I know exactly what you have to offer there is no interest or curiosity I don't need to date you any further because you have just showed me everything you have to offer so stop it right put the demo put the presentation away I had an, I as another example I mean recently I've been working with this company and they they opened up and we started having this this conversation and they're showing me some type of like software as a service type of thing and they said and then they stopped as like about 20 minutes into their presentation and they said hold on let us ask you a question what's the biggest mistake um, companies make when they're talking to their clients and point blank I said it's people that start off opening with the demo. I said, you don't know about me. I said, a demo should be used as a selling tool. The demo should be used after I know how you want to be able to be treated. After I know what concerns you the most, I'm going to show you inside this demo what makes the most amount of sense. Now, we have... Um, we have so much information on there, all right? Um, and Doug, I'm gonna get your question in a second here. But the idea, when we're going through the demo, it should be, this is what you specifically you need. How, this is what specifically what you need. Here's how we can address that in the demo, right? Um, Barb, this is specifically what we need. Okay, let's, let's go through the presentation. But you will kill your sales cycles faster if you jump to that, that proposal, that demo, that presentation right away. And how do you know? How do you know? You guys, go back to your sales cycle, right? Look at your sales cycle. If you're having a meeting and those meetings aren't leading to proposals, you know, you know from this reason, from the science, from the math that says out of every four meetings, two of them should lead to proposals. And if two of them aren't leading proposals, it means that you're hosting crappy meetings. So change your meetings, get better at your meetings first, before you start working on what your proposals or what your um, marketing or your Facebook 
Facebook ads are. Now, Doug had a question in there and he says, what happens if someone says, well, we have all the information on your website, we know exactly what you need. Doug, simply take, put less information on your website. Take off the information or put them into hidden landing pages that maybe you can share with people. But you have to have a certain level of ambiguity with people. You, they have to be able to understand how it will help them without telling them specifically what they're telling. And we're going to get to that one actually specifically here, which is sell the cake, not the recipe. I challenge you, Doug, with this. Are you selling the recipe or are you selling the cake? The customer wants to buy an experience. They want to, so think of this in terms of wedding cakes, right? When we sell the wedding cake, we buy the wedding cake, not because of the ingredients that goes into the wedding cake, but because of how this wedding cake becomes a feature of photos and experience and the cutting of the cake and the smashing it into our spouse's mouth. But it becomes a part of this bigger picture. Now, let's be clear um, that nobody in their right minds, unless it was a wedding, unless it was pristine and amazing and everything else like this, is going to spend a hundred dollars, two hundred, three hundred dollars on a cake because they're attending a backyard party on a Sunday afternoon. Right? We just don't do that. We also don't spend that amount of money on a cake because we know exactly what goes in it. Yet too many service providers are telling their clients what goes into the recipe. Well, listen, I would like to buy a cake. Fantastic. Listen, we're going to spend about three hours developing your cake. We're going to put in some flour, some eggs, some sugar, some butter. We're going to mix it all together and we'll throw in a pan at 350 degrees for about two and a half hours and we'll ice it for you. Does that sound good? And the person has heard flour, sugar, eggs, butter. Um, well, yeah, I guess so. But now, sorry, why am I spending all this money for this pro product? I don't understand. Like, you've just explained to me exactly what you're going to do. So why don't I just go ahead and either buy a cake bake product, or if it's that simple, I can just do it myself. And what we do is we end up focusing the clients on all the things that we're going to do. So the clients will react to us in one of two days. Thanks. I'll try it myself. Listen, I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, then I'll come back to you and I'll contact you and see if that's ready. Or, hmm, that sounds like a lot of money for what I essentially get. Um, so I'm just going to see what else I can finally get. And then you end up finding out like six months later that they end up buying somebody else's service for like three times more than what you were planning on charging them anyway. And you're like, ah, like, I don't understand. It's because you were focusing on the recipe. You were focusing on the steps that you're going to do as opposed to what they were going to get at the end. What was the experience going to be like? How were they going to use the cake as a central point? I talk about this sometimes as the tra destination transportation as well. Focus them on where they will be when the cake is cut and smashed in everyone's mouth and how that will feel as opposed to what you're going to do to bake that cake, okay? Which goes back to Doug, your point about what do you do? You're probably outlining your recipe, essentially. So you've given them the entire recipe, and now they said, well, we don't actually need to hire you anymore because we see exactly what you're going to do. We're happy to have that information. Um, there was another question in here with the chat. Let me just take a quick look. How do you pilot or test drive product if you're selling first and creating later? Awesome. So how do you, so, I mean, you let your clients know that they're going to be the guinea pigs, but it's much easier to test drive or create a product when somebody has already given you a dollar to be able to do it. What I don't want to see, I see too many entrepreneurs that were like, listen, I'm going to spend all this time. I'm going to spend like the next three months creating a product and then I'm going to get out there and then I'm going to see who's going to be willing to buy that. Okay. Unless we're talking about like app technology or something else, um, it'll be a little bit different. You need to get something out of there, right? Which was then going to be your minimal viable product. Um, but the big thing about minimal viable product is it's not your minimal viable product of what can I get out there that is the lowest dollar, but rather what can I get out there that's going to take us the least amount of energy to create that's going to bring us in the highest profitability. This runs very much on the Pareto curve, right? What is the 20% of the work that's going to get you to 80% of the result? So if you have to do that, then focus on what's 20%, what's the 20% that you have to do to have people reasonably understand what they're going to get as 80% of the result. 
The other thing to understand is that if you're able to create it, so for instance, when I created our sales training program, KO Sales U, I didn't have anything. I had nothing written out. And what I ended up doing was I ended up creating conversations for people. Um, uh, I ended up creating tr uh, training for people. I said, this is what we're going to cover. And they said, that sounds amazing. And I'm like, awesome. And there's more to the story than that. But essentially what I did was I ended up getting them to buy the program. Um, we, I, I told them that I was going to deliver it at week, like weekly over a course of 10 weeks. And the only thing I had to know was that I only had to be one week ahead of them. Right. I didn't have to get all 10 weeks of content before I felt like I was ready to serve it to them. I sold them the idea that this is what I'm going to create for them. They were in agreement. And then I went out and I started to create it. It was a lot easier to create it when the money was already there. And I'm happy to talk to you, take that conversation offline. If there's more to, to that conversation. So number six, agree to something, including the highest level. So the intention of the phone call is to get the meeting. The intention of the meeting is to get the next meeting. And we continue to book the next meeting, next meeting, next meeting, next meeting, until we eventually get to proposal or until we say this deal isn't going to happen. And then we can move on. But you never, ever hands down non-negotiable leave a meeting until you have the next meeting booked and i don't care if the next meeting booked has to be in a month or three months or a year from now maybe not a year from now because then it'll just be completely different but honestly in a month or three months time right if somebody said oh i'm so busy i'm so busy give me a call in like three weeks you'd be like you know what how about we just book something in the calendar four weeks from now right hopefully you're not nearly as busy in four weeks from now and if we need to move it then we have it in the calendar but if it's not in the calendar it doesn't exist okay i do not want to have you moving your you're moving momentum you created a lot of inertia right inertia is like the force of like moving something the very first time and the power it takes and then when it starts to move it's a lot easier to move along but why would you go ahead and spend all that energy getting that very first meeting only to like put it back to standstill by saying listen i'll call you sometime next week how about I follow you, uh, follow up with you, you know, I don't know, you want to say like Thursday or Friday? And the client's like, yeah, okay. Okay, like seriously, I don't want to be dealing with flaky salespeople. I, if you're so confident that your solution works, if you're so confident that I des as a client, I deserve to have your solution, if you're so confident that I need your solution to work, why are you giving me flakiness, right? Oh, well, maybe Thursday, maybe Friday, maybe at some point, you're not doing yourself or me any favors. Because if you truly believe that I need your product, then just book some time in the calendar. Listen, I'm gonna follow up with you Thursday at nine o'clock. It'll be 15 minutes. I just wanna know what your thoughts are, right? Listen, um, you know, if they, let's assume that you get to the proposal stage. Let's assume that um, for whatever reason, the client is like, well, I'm not really, it's a lot more money than I expected. It's a lot like less than, um, you know, than, than what I was hoping to get, whatever it is. Okay. Now in KO Sales U, we talk about setting expectations and anchoring expectations. But for today, we're not going to go through that. But let's assume that you get to that point. What do you do then? Then you agree to the highest level. Agreeing to the highest level means that can we agree that this relationship is worth something? Can we agree that what we've started to create here has brought you value, is meaningful to you? Yeah, yeah, actually, I can agree to that. Awesome, right? Agree to something. Can we agree that this is something that you want to look at in your next quarter? Yes, I do agree to that. Awesome. Can we set up a meeting for us to like meet in April, right? If it has to be April 15th or April 30th, that is better than just hoping we're going to call them, catch them off guard, and they're going to agree for the meeting. Well, okay, Tally, you got a big one. I'm going to leave that one until the very end here because we're almost here at the end. Um, good habits take time and support. This is my final tip, tip for you guys today is that we, what you're going to do, like when we're creating sales cycles and we're creating the sales conversations, these are habits. Sales is a skill, number one. 
we don't just sit at a piano one day and just like be able to play. And we don't just open a cookbook one day and be like, oh, I know exactly how to cook, you know, a turkey, right? Because I opened this cookbook. No, we have to go ahead and we have to practice it. And we have to do it again and again. And because sales is the skill of communicating with others, do you think you can go ahead and think in your head and say, okay, I think this is what I'm going to say and now I'm going to do it, right? Do you think because when you learn, when you learn how to play soccer, right, you learn how to pass a ball to someone, you learn how to, um, to run it up and like kick it to get it past a goalie, you can still do that by, their, by yourself. There's certain things that you can do by yourself. I get it. You can hang up the fake goalie in the goal net, right, to provide you some type of action, but it doesn't provide you the same impact of actually having someone there to actually avoid you getting the soccer ball in the net. Having, you know, if you well, like, uh, ping pong is a great example. When I was a kid, um, my poor, I had two, I have two younger sisters, and neither when we had a ping pong table in our basement, and neither of my sisters liked ping pong, and I loved it. And I was one of those kids that set up like the half ping pong table so that I could just like hit it like back to myself over and over and over again. Now it's great, and it will help me develop a skill but doesn't actually prepare me for when I am actually playing against somebody. Does that actually help me for when I actually want to have play in a tournament? Sales is no different. You can go ahead and say, I think I know exactly what I need to do. I can sit there and I can plan it. But what we think in our head sounds completely different when it comes out of our mouths. And it, it ends up reacting with somebody completely different. And when they give us something that we have not prepared for, how do you go ahead and know what you need to do? First and foremost is that whatever your bad habits are, maybe they were outlisted in one of these conversations today, just stop it. Stop reinforcing bad habits. But this is somebody who says, I wish I could eat healthy, but I don't know how, so I'm gonna to continue to eat packaged foods, right? You're just gonna end up reinforcing bad habits, right? This is a person that wants to learn how to run the very first time, but hasn't actually run, learned how to run a proper running technique. And every time they try to run more than a, than a half an hour, their knee starts hurting because they haven't learned a really good technique. They haven't worked with somebody on this. It's about pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, making yourself feel more comfortable. Listen, it's okay when we're like learning how to swim and everybody's like in the same swim class and we're all at the same level, you're like, okay, this actually doesn't feel too bad. And then you see like the one person like swimming last. You're like, ah, oh, that actually feels really scary. Or maybe you're like me, you're like, I wanna be that person. Like that person that's swimming crazy laps, like that is me. You want to embrace these conversations. When I worked in corporate sales, I would meet for one of my, um, one of my friends for lunch maybe every three months or so. She was also in corporate sales and we worked in completely different industries. She worked in oil and gas and I worked in business to business technology. And we would still sit down with each other once every three months to have a conversation about what would you do in this situation or how do you approach a client in this way? I still meet with some of my, my regular corporate sales people just to ask them, what did you do? How would you apply this because when I hear their types of feedback or their own individual experiences, it helps to strengthen my own experiences. One of the reasons why our program is constantly evolving is because students like you, you bring me things that I hadn't faced before and I will go to my network and I will ask questions and I will do research and I reinforce it and I make it a stronger program because we all can't think of every single situation. But when we work together, when we find a supportive tribe and people that are doing the exact same thing as us, it makes us all better. So whatever you look for, whether that is through our formal program or finding people just like you, that you can have specifically a sales conversation, not just generic entrepreneurship and business, because those will go down different tangents, but specifically sales you will make your sales process tighter, you will find the fastest way to that dollar, and you will sell more faster. Awesome. So Nabil did take our program. He says, listen, Cam, He's like, number one, I am so glad you continue to, to be in touch with me. He's like, what I learned 
but this was week six of our program, over a 10-week program. He's like, I really feel like you undervalued your program. He's like, I have gotten so much more clarity on my clients. I now feel more comfortable when I talk to them. I don't feel like I'm constantly pushing them. And I now actually get to hold a much more powerful position because I know that I get to actually question, are they the right fit for me or not? Rob Crooks took our program and he said, I wish when I started my business, this was the first thing I spent money on. He's like, unfortunately, I spent a ton of money on Facebook ads and marketing. And it was, and it was literally thousands of dollars that went down the drain. He's like, cause we, we didn't generate nearly as many leads as the marketing agency claimed that they were going to. And he goes, and the leads that they did bring us, he goes, they weren't even the right types of companies. Because I, had I spent my money on this program the very first time, he's like, that was money that could have been in my bank. The longer you wait, that's revenue. And Cameron, an engineer who took our program, when he understood more about when we were touching on the feelings, that personal motivation for someone to, to take action, he says it completely turned the analysis and the logic on its head. He goes, I realized that people weren't buying my, my solutions because of what it did, but rather how the relationship made them feel. And when we were able to create a, an agreement that this was worth more than all of these little pieces, he's like, I moved sales cycles from being flaky, a five or a six, to like nines and tens out of tens. I had more knowledge and more power in knowing when they were going to close. It felt like magic. So this is me today. I am uh, I'm the person on the left. I am also LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. I'm Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. Um, that's my third book, Sell More Faster. Um, Kim, Terry, I owe you. Um, I said at the beginning, um, I'm going to give you a, a phone call immediately after this if you have time. Otherwise, I'll send you an email. Um, feel free to decline it if uh, you don't have a moment as well as Startup Canada's Female Entrepreneur of the Year. And I am the creator of KO Sales You. So what it is, is it is a 10 week program. Um, we allow ourselves to have limited class size to provide lots of personalized attention. It is in a Zoom format, but because we're limited in class size, I get to see all your bright, smiley, shiny faces, and we interact constantly. You're asking questions, you're posing questions to the group. I'm having everybody help to feel different opinions, different answers, because I don't want to be the person that has all the answers for you. I want to be the person that ultimately helps to bring you to the resources. I want you to know where to find them. I want to just provide you the map and the guide to be able to know how you're going to grow your business. Or um, you can get uh, guaranteed results, but if you wanna have more, check out my meeting link. I'm actually gonna put in the chat here right now. Um, let's just uh, open that up here. So that is kimorleski.com slash meetings slash kim18. That is my personal meeting link, okay? So you won't go through, um, sometimes you'll get meeting links that will go to somebody on my team. Because you are all here, I want to give you my personal meeting links. If you are ready to say, you know what, I want to be like any of the stories that you've told, we have our next class, which starts on March 31st. Uh, we have our next class of starts on March 31st, which gives you six, there's six spots left still available for that. Uh, we're bringing in some amazing people. You can also graduate in July. If July is when you want to start seeing results of your classroom, if you want to see sooner, take the, the June, take the, the June graduation class. If you want to, if you're ready to start, you know, getting the impact in the summer, right? You want to turn that whole summer slowdown into the fantasy that it is, get yourself into the April classroom. Um, we have the, uh, you also have your KO Sales U online learning program. Um, so that gives you all the materials without the instructor-led content. There's two payments of $9.97 uh, for that, which allows you a 60-day guarantee, which means that if for whatever reason, after 60 days, you've completed up to six weeks of content and you're still unsatisfied, money back, no questions asked. If you decide you would rather 
be in an instructor-led program, we'll just apply all of your payments to the self-study program. But don't let anything stop you because we'll actually do payments for our regular um, KO sales you program. Payments as low as like 500, I think it's like 501 and 40 cents or something, some type of math worked out. Um, but like payments essentially as low as $500 to get you started. So let's get you going. Um, but no matter what, I want, I want to help you get what you need. I would love to see you book a 20 minute sales strategy session. Go ahead, check out the meeting links um, again. Um, and our next webinar is uh, next month, Monday, April 6th. You're, we're gonna be covering the 10 questions to ask in every single sales meeting. Okay, education is not the same as application, so I want you to do something with what you've learned today. What is the one thing that you're going to take away? And I want you to go and apply for that, right? Find out what that is. If you have any questions about the program, you have any questions um, just for me about your own sales cycle, go ahead, book your time with me. I would be internally grateful to help you grow your business all the way through. But what I don't wanna see is you taking longer. Don't spend your time asking yourself, how do I do this? I am here to help you. I am here to give you the process and the formula to help you get those revenue dollars as quickly as possible. And the faster you sign up, the faster you take one of those limited seats, the faster we can help you grow your business. Um, I do, if you have to take off, I completely understand. I'm going to leave a couple minutes. We're going to go a little bit long for those of you that have a couple questions here. Um, let's see, Doug says, um, I'm asking for client that now for what they want. They say they look at my website and they, I'm asking the client what they want and they say, they say, look at my website. So the, I'm not too sure, Doug, you're saying that the client is saying like, listen, I'm just going to take a look at your website. Um, Doug, remember, we want to get the person to that meeting as quickly as possible. So listen, like, you know, I'm happy to find you what you want, right? Would you, would you be available to like, you know, sit down for 20 minutes on the phone call so I can understand a little bit more about what you're looking for? Um, you know, get the meeting, right? Don't just assume that they're going to find the information on their own. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take a look. Can I just take a look at your website? Yeah, absolutely. And how about we reconnect on Thursday at nine o'clock? Um, let's just, you know, let me understand a little bit more of what you're, what what you're going through um, you know oftentimes I've created customized solutions for clients as well whether you are or whether you aren't it doesn't matter people want to feel individualized they want to feel custom and they want to feel important and so by letting them know that you're still willing to work with them even though they can find the, the resources on your website it makes them feel really important Barb says most of my clients are international most of my sales are done through email how do I apply this um, Barb, it depends. So, I mean, you know, it depends on what types of clients. This is ideally for um, business to business um, consulting services. Um, I'm going to assume that you're a business consultant unless you tell me otherwise. But, um, but what, like, what I want you to do is, I mean, where you have your meetings, I mean, these can be Zoom meetings. Like, I mean, you can see my face and, and I do a lot of Zoom meetings. I either do phone calls or I do a lot of Zoom meetings, but it has to be in the calendar. And uh, one of the things we covered in Nine Fail Errors as well is to stop sending proposals via email. Um, email is the lowest for from a communication. So unless your, your product or service is at a very transactional dollar point, and transactional dollar points are usually less than $2,000, um, uh, then continue to communicate through email. But if you're trying to sell like $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 through email, I promise you it's never going to happen um, because nobody's going to exchange a whole bunch of emails and say, yes, I'm happy to, to transfer you $100,000 or even $10,000 without ever having a conversation with you. So if you're... If if your products or services are greater than transactional, like transactional is, I, I'm willing to, it becomes throwaway money for me. If this doesn't work, um, I'm happy to cut my losses and run, then continue to do on emails. If you're higher than that, then you need to just like book people through through uh, phone calls, through Zoom accounts. That's part of the reason why we're, we only focus our program on Canada and the US, uh, because we're all central time zones. Um, we, we do have a lot of people that will reach out to us from like Australia, and India um, and the UK and everything um, and unless they want to fit in our mold otherwise we just can't cater to them because we're a time zone specific um, company um, uh, Lynn privately yes um, please uh, please reach out to Caitlin on on that one um, oh tally sorry if you presented a proposal and say it has two options so there was 
if you present a proposal and let's say it has two options so there was no total because it depends on the option after the presentation the client says yes let's start next week needed to fix this proposal and send the invoice you send and hear nothing back you try to call no answer how would you interpret it um yeah you you didn't set expectations on what the price was and so now they have sticker shock and um you know i mean you you left the most important piece of information to like allow them to interpret it how they wanted to interpret it um the price is the most important piece of information and so you want to make sure that you know no matter what in your pricing and your solution your prices are there you want to be open and honest and transparent and by not providing that transparency people are thinking that you're trying to you know do, do something so the only way you can possibly do if you're trying to win this is um you know go in the assumption that the answer is already no because they ghosted you it kind of already is so in which case um you approach them and you can either email them um, text them or something and be like have you given up on this pro project um have you decided that this project is not for you and then reflect back on it and ask yourself where did you lose them um, it was it was actually right in this specific spot because um, yeah because I mean you know who who wants to say like you know yes I'll marry you and then you're like awesome and then um, you say oh by the way like I actually live in this basement suite and you know I have like you know the IRS after me for seventy thousand dollars and everything you left up like the most important pieces of information and then you just emailed it to them you left it also to the lowest form of communication so I'm sorry it sucks um, losing a deal sucks um who what tips do you have to seek first to understand in just 20 minutes when it takes them 20 minutes to stop talking okay well you have to control that situation so it is up to you to knock it down right or like just remind them listen in the interest of time um i do have a few other questions i need to ask you um listen i am really interested in hearing more about this or listen i've only given you um i only booked 20 minutes for this time um perhaps it makes more sense to um to book a second meeting but be aware that booking a second meeting are they if they've taken 20 minutes to talk all about themselves and you either determine that they're not really qualified or that they're probably not perfect fit don't waste your time with more time with them um you know just just kind of call the spade the spade otherwise if you're still not really sure um you know just use that empathy approach be like maybe they need to get something off their chest and i'm willing to spend more time um, price was there the client chose the price option but now they're not um okay so tally says the price was there uh tally let's um let's get on the phone because then obviously i'm not i'm not going to communicate thank you thank you all so much you guys stayed late i appreciate it it was a pleasure i um i already got a few notifications for some 20 minute phone calls so i appreciate everything you all have to offer and i hope to see you all uh next month Bye bye